The Jean Paul Moore Lecture is always a highlight of these meetings. It was started in 1981, and the first lecturer was G. Paul Moore. It, it was named for him by the Board of Directors and has continued to provide an opportunity for people of great stature in the field to share their philosophical and historical perspectives on voice and to provide an overview of their particular areas of interest. This year's G. Paul Moore Lecture is Dr. Mike Johns. Mike graduated from Hopkins, trained at the University of Michigan where he also was an NIH T32 research fellow, continued his fellowship in laryngology at Vanderbilt. <coughs> He's a member of Phi Beta Kappa and Alpha Omega Alpha and has received many other well-deserved accolades. Currently he's a professor at USC <coughs> where he also directs the Voice Center and is chief of the Division of Laryngology. He has published some 120 peer-reviewed papers, delivered fabulous lectures all over the world. He has co-edited a book on geriatric laryngology with Karen Cost and me. Uh, which I can say because there's no financial conflict if the royalties were all turned over to the American Academy of Laryngology. <clears throat> and his knowledge and scope goes far beyond geriatric voice. He's of course interested in all areas of laryngology and focal dystonias and in geriatric voice, but his knowledge of geriatric otolaryngology and geriatrics in general is deep, appreciated, and I am sure we will learn a lot from his G. Paul Moore lecture today. Mike? Stoked 
my feelings of I'm not worthy. But I wanted, for those of you who don't know, I wanted to highlight a couple of uh, important contributions to Chief Palmer right here. This is one of them, JMI, big JMI. Um, look at this helmet. Pretty cool. So even even when I was in training um, in '96 to 2002 at Michigan, um, we take for granted now our ability to all look at the same thing. And we, at the time when I was a resident doing direct arthroscopy with our you know, eyes and our eyeballs, and um, faculty members say, "Okay, I want you to do this and look at that." All right, great. Did you see that? Definitely saw it. <laughs> there was no real way to kind of know for sure. We were relying on, um, on uh, uh, anyways, a bit of, of, of shared description. But look at this. So the whole goal here was, you know, we as otolaryngologists, archaeologists, we spend our careers looking in the head holes, right? And they're dark. Um, this device allowed the viewer to have what they're seeing projected on a TV screen. Okay? That's transformational, right, for our field. Additionally, he um, made great strides in high-speed video endoscopy. And this is a graph from a paper in 60 days, not on here, that we're so familiar with, right? Every single time we go to a, a, a voice meeting or we're talking, this is kind of a, a graph that we're looking at. Um, can you go ahead and play this uh, video here? Um, I found this one too when uh, Palmer was at University of Florida with Dr. Holly in here. This is called laminography, sto stroboscopic laminography of the larynx. And this was the first view of coronal section vocal fold vibration. Transformative, that's something we're still trying to look at now. Okay, well if it was done in the 60s, why aren't we doing it now? Um, this right here. Well, it took a lot of radiation in some rock. And a lot of radiation. So, uh, we don't want to have a therapeutic uh, element to our diagnostics. As we go. But I include this and also won the 2016 Strobe Oscars Award. And, uh, well, the Strobe Oscars will be back, don't worry. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, tap into that later. So, um, after digging deep into some of G. Paul Moore's work, this was the only thing that would come um, to mind uh, for me. Uh, and I, I'm so glad that uh, Dr. Sadloff read the description of the G. Paul Moore uh, lecture because it kind of brought it back. I read it, um, that description as well. I said, okay, person of stature in the field. Well, I'm a relatively tall stature in the field. Okay, it's not some stature, but some stature. And um, to share their historical perspectives and their thoughts and kind of what they've, um, uh, their, their journey has been like with it. So I'm like, okay, all right, I can do that. So um, without further ado, let's, let's talk about my journey in the aging voice. Um, okay, financial disclosures, none. Aging voice disclosures, many, many. There are people in this room who know more about this than I do. I am not a singular source of authority for things on aging voice. It's been a passion of mine, and we've made some contributions here and there that I hope to, to share. Um, but there's folks in this room who know more, and uh, so if I say things wrong, just let go, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you, can tell, you can tell me later. Yeah, it'll, it'll be okay. Um, there are contributions around aging voice and people who've made substantive contributions that I'm not going to mention time and whatnot, and it's supposed to be focused about on me, so less about you and, and, and more about you. Okay. Um, and so in, uh, as we get going here in my journey on the aging voice, let's start. I was born very young. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that in front of, in front of an audience. All right. But instead, let's fast forward to 2003. So we're going to skip over all my uh, uh, all the, the early years. We're going to go in 2003. I just completed um, my formal training. Learning is a lifelong process, and we're never done. And so here I was in 2003. Now you look at this picture, and um, maybe you see two people. I see one. Um, <laughs> this is this is Dr. E. Happner, and this is me back in the day. 
And um, we have been arm and arm through our careers. And there is nothing that I could have accomplished professionally without her. And she's very deserving to be up here on the stage. And even though she's right there, she's also up here at the same time. Um, we started with a few principles. The principles that we started with are, number one, we're going to function as a team. Number two, our speech pathologists are not technicians for the doctors. We're peers. They're not here to mop up our surgical problems and we're going to work together. Group gain over individual gain, particularly as it pertains to um, finances. And, um, and that has served us well over the years. Um, so, I, I love this. Um, I did my training at the University of Michigan, and Norm Hokikian at the University of Michigan was my inspiration to go into laryngology. I was sure I was going to be a head and neck cancer surgeon. And through exposure and mentorship, I don't have personal um, vocal talents and vocal performance or a background in that regard. It was through mentorship, Norm Hokikian. And he was the fir first aging voice patient I saw was with Norm. We didn't see a lot in residence, partly exposure to the clinics. Uh, we didn't have that much. And uh, the times were a little different back then. But I remember distinctly one patient that I saw with Norm, and uh, he reassured this patient that there's nothing bad happening and talked about healthy voice production and reading aloud and singing and things like that. Um, and that was my first foray. Did my fellowship at Vanderbilt and Bob Ossoff, Mark Curie, Galen Garrett, and of course Jim Netterville. And I remember Jim Netterville telling me we were talking a little bit about aging voice and he says, you know some, some of these folks, when they get a cold, their voice sounds better. <laughs> and, that, and that was a tip off to me about what's happening in the superficial layer of the lamina propria in aging. And that was a little gem um, that I had. And then, of course, uh, Bob Sadloff here, look at us, look at us go. And, um, and he has been a mentor, uh, an advisor to me, and an incredible role model for how we function as a team and how we work together to raise the tide so all boats float higher. And uh, so that's where I was in 2013, starting off. And I was fortunate enough to have a, a privilege, really, to have exposure to wonderful people who gave me advice that I was starting with in 2003. And uh, Lauren Pratt is a name that some, of, some folks in this room may know. May he rest in peace. Uh, an otolaryngologist, famous otolaryngologist, solo practitioner in Waterville, Maine. Yet, he went on to lead all the major organizations in otolaryngology over the course of his career. And what I learned from him is this piece of advice here, be thoughtful and curious. And that came when 1997, and I was in high school, and Lauren Pratt was visiting professor at Johns Hopkins, where he did his residency training in the 30s. And, um, and that year, and people in Philly will know what this is, this is the 17-year uh, cicada, every 17 years, these characters come around and they're all over the place and, uh, and it happened to be going down when he was here staying with us in our house and my parents pulled out the brooms and said get out there and like we'll start start sweeping them up and I'm like ah. and so I'm sweeping up these, these these critters that most people want to kind of avoid and Lauren came out there incredibly curious and he says let's, let's I want to work with you on this and talk about it and he's always been very interested in nature and we walked through the life cycle, and he knew things about it, and he taught me about this, uh, this little creature. And I realized that, wait a minute, through the mundane process of a task, maybe we call it clinic even, there are things that we can investigate and know and learn more. And so I learned about the cicada. And I was, just before I came here, I was at my folks' house helping them downsize. And we were looking at things, and I came across this little uh, cicada. Uh, little pin here, and I said, you know what, Mom, can I have that? That's my mom there in the background. Uh, it's our dog, our dog Trudy, up at Lauren's place up in, in Waterville, Maine. So that was when I was in high school, be thoughtful 
and curious in everything that you do. Okay, this one has a lot of folks on it. Um, teamwork outweighs individual contribution. And um, that matters. Here's Norm and me. I learned that from there. Center for Global Health, collaborative approach, speech language pathology, singing voice rehabilitation. I was exposed to that in medicine. See, that matters. Um, of course, Bob Sadloff from the Voice Foundation. Here we are. My dad's in there, too. Uh, we're looking well, younger, all of us, huh? Um, my fellowship team, Mark, Galen, Bob Ossoff, all individuals who instilled in me that it's not about me. It's about what we're doing to make the world better and working together to accomplish that and share it. And that's uh, a fun picture from uh, back in our Emory days. Marina Gilman had to fly, Edie and me. We had our offices next to each other. And when we needed to have impromptu conferences, we'd just roll on out there. <laughs> This is from my dad. He's my dad. He was an otolaryngologist. And yeah, still is an otolaryngologist. That does practice. His advice was work hard on things where you can make a difference. Okay, and there's three components to that that he, that he had. Things that you see a lot. So if you don't see a lot, you're not going to be able to make a difference. Things that you care about. So if you don't care about it, you're not going to put in the effort of work to make a difference. And, and most important, and that people around you are good at. Right? Getting back to that team-based approach and me not being the individual purveyor of any excellence alone. Find something that your institution around you is really, really good at and that you can dovetail in and synergize with. And so that was critical um, advice that is salient for uh, the aging voice elements of what we talked about. And lastly, I think actually this is really the most important one. Um, this is my mom, Trina Johns, and she wrote a book, What If Everybody Did? Um, she never sold any of them, she gave them away, donated them, and uh, but there's a few out there, I think, on the World Wide Web. And um, this is her book, and she was loaded with fun and energy, and she taught me specifically, happiness is a decision. Kindness is a decision, too. Happiness is a decision, and so much of our perspective in life comes back to the lenses through which we look at things, and making that decision to be happy matters. A lot of bad things that happen. We don't have to be unhappy. Okay, so here we are in 2003. Those are the bits of advice that I had, was, was, was blessed with. And um, 2003, our baby boomers were starting to retire. And, um, and at that time, 10,000 folks were estimated to be turning 65 every day. And they're going to be living a chunk of time. We call them. So here's an age sex graph of, of just the population and, um, in 1950 and then in 2010. And you see the, the proportion of folks above 65 growing. Uh, substantially in that window. We have to remember that aging is not a disease, okay? Aging is not a disease and there's variability in the presentation of our symptoms and things that happen to our bodies um, as we get older. And I, I want to be like any of these folks. In fact, I, think I, I don't have any of these capabilities right now. <laughs> okay. So aging, now aging voice in, in 2003, where were we um, at that time? Well, you did a PubMed search, filtered down to that that timeline, there was 257 um, papers. You could read it all. You could have, have consumed pretty much all the literature on that, that topic. Well, that's changed now, right? I mean, the explosion of information is so vast, it's very, very hard um, to do that. And I did. I read, read all these, and um, I think it's quite possible I didn't, but tried. <laughs> Um, and there's a couple that came up that I wanted to point out. This one here, uh, look, we're in our, uh, our Sun Bartizza Award uh, winner uh, today. This is a review article. It was published around the same time I was, I was finishing up my training. Um, basically, kind of summed up everything that um, we knew about Aging Voice at the time. And a lot of it, and most of it, really hasn't changed a lot. So I would refer you to this. 
But importantly, the, in, embedded in this, this paper, we like, talked about here, there was a very small a cohort of patients through which she applied LSVT to vocal atrophy in each and voice. So that was intriguing. Little, little different um, thought process there at the time. And then another one that was what came out right around the same time in 2002, intrigued me, it's a Swedish group here, talking about vocal fold injection augmentation in the office. And this, is some, this was something that was not being done very much at that time. Of course, Teflon injections in the office, herbido, this, this work has been done, and people before them, but it was sort of lost due to loss of injectables. And this hyaluronic acid is still used today. They were doing unilateral injections for vocal atrophy and noted improvements there. So we had some thoughts, okay, about voice therapy, some thoughts about procedural intervention for aging voice. And there Edie and I were. And uh, of course, her eyes are going down here. My eyes kind of going this direction. And, uh, and we were curious about this. So, a uh, little story. Um, tapping into that uh, piece of advice uh, you know, from, from a day. 2003, a lot of older folks in Atlanta, not a lot of folks who were thinking about this. We were seeing a lot of people who had uh, voice changes associated with aging. And, um, and we were like, okay, we we're curious. And uh, turns out Emory, where we were, Emory Voice Center, but Emory University, geriatric medicine is one of their great strengths. They had a whole campus called Wesley Woods, which was dedicated to geriatric care, independent living through to acute long-term care, rehabilitative elements, all of this. They were funded well, there were lots of resources. And so we're wondering about aging voice, and we're thinking about, she's thinking about voice therapy, I'm thinking about putting needles in. And we're like, well, let's do a, let's do a, random, let's do a randomized clinical trial. And, um, and there was a, a very generous uh, grant program called the Janigan uh, Award through the American Geriatric Society to try to spur specialty interest in, um, in geriatrics. And I was aware of this. And here we are thinking we're going to do our randomized clinical trial. It's exciting. And so we decided to go over and let's meet with the, let's meet with the people who are experts in geriatric medicine. And, um, one of those individuals was Ken uh, Brigham, who was leading our respiratory health center and was telling them about the idea about doing this randomized control trial. It's like, don't do that. <laughs> well, why not? I mean, RCT is what we want to do. You know, we want to test our clinical, our, our clinical, our tools in the right way. It's like that's not the future. It's like you can do that now if you want to. It's going to be hard. You're going to have a hard time recruiting people. It's going to take lots of problems with it. Um, but that's not what the future is going to be. You know, with this. It's going to be in regenerative medicine. And so he uh, redirected uh, me to uh, ask more foundational questions and uh, try to build try to build a line of research. And so through those discussions, we kind of came up with three broad research questions that many people, these aren't, these aren't, there's nothing really unique about these, right? Uh, aging voice doesn't matter. Well, what's going on and how can we treat them? But they reframed our, that conversation, the people who are excellent around us, reframed our thinking about um, what we need to be talking about the aging voice. And some of these things were low-hanging fruit. And we're busy clinicians, you know, we're not um, spending you know, substantial amounts of time in the lab, we're spending most of our time seeing folks and, and hopefully making them better. And so we got some low-hanging fruit along, along the way, so we'll talk about that. So it doesn't matter, well here we are in 1950s, that same population graph just showing what is happening in that top bar, our geriatric population is growing. So the people are around us, okay, it's happening. And so we wanted to know, okay, what's happening with voice? There really wasn't much um, uh, described about the prevalence of dysphonia in the geriatric population and what had been previously published was, um, was actually a treatment-seeking population. It was not an uh, assessment of what's happening in the community. Of course, prevalent studies, you've got to get into the community. Emory had the community, all these independent living centers. We went out into the community. And Justin Golub was a medical student. He was an ACE, a now at Columbia. And um, 
and he did the, the, the yeoman's work around this. And we interviewed individuals, and we used the voice related quality of life uh, validated uh, metric to see what was happening in this particular population. And uh, so we published this paper, Prevalence of Perceived Dysphonia, um, in JAGS, and Journal of the American Geriatric Society. And we found that 20% of people over age 65 in this cohort reported dysphonia. But more importantly, 13% over 1 in 10 had moderate to profoundly reduced quality of life as it pertains to their voice. Little sidebar questions, those perceived largely to be the normal part of aging, and there was this misperception that just nothing can be done. It is what it is. Um, so it matters. Um, others have gone on to do, um, uh, to validate this. It's always nice when you've got uh, you know, people who are kind of better at stuff than you, like Nelson Roy and Seth Cumlin, who publish work and then all of a sudden shows the same thing. We're like, all right, we're on, we're on track. Um, so anyways, but through this, we, 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 we believe we added to the body of literature that, that it doesn't matter. But we have to remember, we didn't scope these people. We didn't know. We didn't do any diagnosis. We just asked them, you know, voice problem or not, how, you know, how much is it affecting you? And, uh, and so we did another little study looking at our treatment-seeking population of uh, people who are, are older, and it was, I, it was, I forget the number of patients, but it was not small. And um, vocal atrophy was really only 25% of the folks. Okay? So we have to remember this when we're, thinking, when we're seeing our older individuals that the majority of people have something, have other things going on that we need to address. And, um, and like I would say most um, things I've done, I, uh, uh, Pete Wu has been a wonderful mentor of mine, and uh, yeah, I believe he's here. Um, of course he's done it before, 1992, he did the same, he did the same, the same study, and uh, that'll become relevant at the, the very, very end. Pete, I love you, you've influenced me uh, greatly along the way. So that's an important point to, to remember. Okay, so what is the aging voice? Um, we all have a sense of kind of what it is. It's loss of vocal capabilities associated with aging. And uh, it can't be heard. Loss of vocal endurance. Increased effort to speak. Reduced power in vocal dynamics. And it's loss of ability to communicate easily, right? And we want to communicate. And voice is the primary way in which we communicate. It's a little different in men and women. Uh, can we go ahead and just play this, play this one right here? So the vision of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long round. So men tend to have a higher pitch, breathier voice. Just take this one across here. You're going to hear Edie and me in the background chit chat, sorry. So men tend to have a higher pitch, breathier voice. Just take this one across here. Women typically have lower pitch early. John W. Ball, who's here in this room, has described the slow and virilization of the voice that happens with the testosterone in women until they reach the old hole where um, pitch goes up and increases. Um, okay, next slide. No, that's me. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So, what's going on? Um, I think we have good foundations from the Wednesday talks about you know how the voice is produced. So, I wanted to um, give a shout out to Tom Cleveland who um, introduced me to this bellows, the reed, and then the horn elements of voice production. And I even have a bellows, and I've got a duck call, and I've got some tubes that we use still in our in our education. It's super fun. Um, it's complex, right? The aging voice is complex. This voice is complex, and it's not just one thing. Um, there are pulmonary changes that happen. More importantly, respiratory, chromatory coordination things, neurologic elements that plays into pulmonary coordination. Um, vocal tract changes. This is largely xerostomia for the most part, and maybe some dynamic agility changes in how we can posture our um, laryngopharyngeal uh, uh, tissues uh, to generate voice. And there's intrinsic changes in the larynx. And um, vocal body changes, a loss of volume. This is from Gail Woodson's uh, chapter in Bob Ossoff's textbook. I just love this little simple little schematic. Yeah, that bit smaller, it's kind of wimpier looking. Um, there's laminar propria changes that happen as well. And so, Again, not a lot of this has been um, described particularly deeply in people in the normal state because we don't end up cutting out the larynx 
often um, for a non, uh, when it's normal, rather than not, not disease. Um, but that, getting back to Ken Brennan's advice, to change from the uh, randomized clinical trial to doing something more foundational, and we developed an age-related uh, uh, model for uh, aging voice using these ex senescence accelerated mice, and we're able to correlate the changes that are happening in mice with uh, aging, with what's happening in people. Loss of body, increased collagen and disorganization of collagen in the lamina propria, loss of hyaluronic acid, and, um, and the goal of this was to build a model to test rejuvenative techniques, getting back to where the future of what we're doing is going to be. But, at the time, this is how we kind of make our diagnosis. Of course, we listen, right? We listen to the patient, we listen to the patient's voice, uh, but we look. And let's just go ahead and play this. It looks a little bit different in men and women. Men tend to see more um, vocal fold bowing, glottal gap. Go ahead and play this one right over here, the one that I'm pointing at as well. Use this right here to move it over there. Yeah. Oh, we want you to play? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. yeah, that one. Yeah. <laughs> Level gap, prominent vocal processes, large mucosal waves, large amplitudes of vibration, superglottal hyperfunction as a compensatory strategy to get them both chords together. Let's play this one down here. Okay, very similar kind of finding. Women, we've got just two examples over here. Let's play this one up here. In women, we tend to see less of that, that, that classic sort of bowing, more loss of tone and tension, kind of floppy vocal folds. Let's play this one down here now. And, and put some glottal insufficiency as well. So it looks a little different. All right. So shifting gears to how can we treat this aging voice, here we are in the middle. These are our components of this complex process that's happening with aging. Xerostomia, managing polypharmacy. We've got to step out of our specialty roles and look at these patients' medication lists. Poly meds stack up. And so a lot of these have anticholinergic side effects. And then there's some natural dryness that happens due to loss of, of the mucus blanket function. Okay, so we treat that by managing the polypharmacy, hydration, steam inhalation, particularly your saline nebulization for surface hydration. Occasionally, we use pelocarpine in the very, very dry patients to induce salivary flow. In terms of the respiratory phonatory coordination arm of this, voice therapy, exuberant voice therapy, there may be a role for some adjunctive treatments like AMST as well. For the vocal fold body atrophy, maybe exuberant voice therapy that you can go to the gym and bulk, bulk things up, perhaps. Our injection augmentation, it's trials, lipo injection, fat injections, bilateral thyroplasty. And this last component, the vocal fold mucosal changes, this remains a big question mark and a frontier for us. Okay, but well, we've got to think practically, we've got to function within the information that we have. And so this is a slide that I've always shown around what's our approach. And um, Tufty's visual display of information inspired me to change the font size about uh, kind of what we think the importance is. Reassurance matters. Reassurance is powerful treatment. Don't forget about it. Just because the patient's treatment seeking and may be bothered by their voice, I always take a moment to reassure the patient there's nothing bad happening that can frame the context for what's, what's going on. Next, voice therapy, exuberant voice therapy. Um, the stretch and flowy kind of stuff doesn't seem to do as much as, um, as, as this. We'll get into that a little bit. And trial injection augmentation, trial injection augmentation, okay? And because we, our procedures for vocal fold augmentation are static geometric solutions to a dynamic problem. Norma Geekian gave that quote. Um, and so there's inherent limitations in this trial and then durable, um, durable treatment. So, and we're curious, you know, what do, what do people um, actually do? So we looked at our cohort of individuals, and this is a treatment seeking group, but only 39% were happy with just reassurance alone. <laughs> Everybody else was wanting something done. And of course there's going to be folks, you know, the doctor sends them, this, my voice has changed, do you care about it? No, not really, just make sure you don't have cancer. Thanks. Um, most people were seeking uh, treatment care. 
and that was it. So we were curious about how well voice therapy works and ED is the inspiration behind of all of this and, um, and we knew that the kind of the stretch and flowy kind of stuff is probably not going to um, be the answer and this is a case controlled study on global function exercises which we thought had a little more um, uh, made a little more teleological sense, and uh, in this case control study, voice therapy indeed improves quality of life. And then I was privileged to be part of, uh, of the early um, elements of this, is Aaron Ziegler and Eve Hapner's work around um, Forte. And we noticed that our older patients, they don't get functional <laughs> lesions, right? That's a repetitive trauma, shearing force phenomenon. And a largely, our older patients just don't have that. It's not the same call center, cheerleader, vocal overdoer phenomenon. And so, in that context, why not just go for it? Just like we're doing with LSVT, right? And it turn, turns out the exams are not all that different in our aging voice patients and some of our Parkinson's patients. And so, that kind of makes sense. And so, those were kind of the principles around which Aaron and Edie built um, Forte. And, um, and that has made a difference for our folks here. Um, it's a recent publication. We won, we're curious about what uh, our laryngology community is actually doing. And, um, and largely, the, uh, the laryngologists in the United States are adhering to that reassurance, voice therapy, trial injection augmentation, durable augmentation um, phenomenon. Lauren Tim and Son um, led this study along with the rest of our our team, and, um, and that was a little contribution. There's some nuance in there about what injectables people are using and stuff that, that's not that important for this talk. I put this up here because I've been talking about voice therapy, and one thing I've learned from eating, and advice to the group here, um, we can know things about voice therapy as doctors, of course, and we should. We should dig deep into it. But my C's are small, lowercase c. And so we need to engage in all our work. We're studying any voice therapy techniques. Make sure this is a pathologist involved in your studies. There's nothing that like with test and I thought was more. We study by doctors on voice therapy. Uh, and I put this up here as a reminder to myself that I'm just a laryngologist. Okay. And there is an art and there is a science around voice therapy that I do not have command on. All right, we're getting along in the tooth here, so uh, we're going to uh, wrap up here. Uh, role of vocal full body augmentation. What transformed our ability to do this is improvements in our visualization, novel approaches to office-based injection, and new materials that we really didn't have in the Teflon era. And, um, and then thyroplast, this is a paper, and I was not on this one, but Carla Dell was, so I feel she's my practice partner, so I feel um, that I, by association, um, this helps for, for uh, select patients who have positive trials. But let's get to this last arm, the vocal full mucosal changes. We have thin, stiff, deficient lam lamina purpur with variable amounts of scar and sulcus. Remember, people have been using their voices for many, many years, and so there's certain amount of this can form um, as well. And I will contend we essentially have no treatment options presently. Saline infusion to try to uh, expand the lamina appropriate. Okay. I don't do that. If I'm going to do that, I do do this. I'll add steroids to it, um, hopefully to change collagen. Um, but it don't work great. You know, there's no, nothing durable that's happening um, with these. And then we have a lot of morbidity from our unreliable SLP replacement surgeries. And so you've got to be pretty far off to want to undergo the risks of these operations because you can be worse from it. So um, this remains our future. So this what used to be for 15 years. This was my future directions slide. And um, uh, <coughs> A couple years ago, I realized, you know, nothing's changed on this. And I was using the same old future direction slide for 15 years. And I'm like, all right, we gotta, you know, so this is a, I gotta do something different. And this is important foundational work. This is some work that we did. Can you play this video here? This is a mouse. This is one of our mouse um, uh, from our SAM, PSAMR. 
these are tiny itty bitty vocal folds. I've got a 38 gauge needle that's coming in here. Mini mouse laryngoscopy. We were working on nanoparticles for slow release delivery of growth factors. This is lipid microtubes. Um, these are um, uh, stem cells that we were able to get uh, live possibility of electrical pacing. So okay, we were talking about okay, what the old future direction slide. But I point out, I want to highlight this work here by Shigeru Hirano, um, great supporter of the Voice Foundation, um, who is using um, basic fibroblast growth factor injections for lambda appropriate restorations available pretty much off the shelf in Japan. And that intrigued me. I said, okay, now we're getting towards the rejuvenation front of something that's actually happening in people. The foundational work's important, okay? And then we, because that's where the future is going to be. But here I am, I'm getting older, 15 years in, the old future direction slide is staying the same. And I wanted to do something different myself. We didn't have basic fibroblast growth factor. Moved to California. California, um, homeopathic, alternate uh, complementary treatment is very popular. It's popular everywhere, but it's extra popular <laughs> in, in Southern California. And, um, and now, I, there's not a lot of evidence around that, right? But evidence, lack of evidence, doesn't mean lack of efficacy. Okay? It just means we don't know. And so we have to be thoughtful and curious. We have to have an open mind about these. And uh, our first foray into studying some of our complementary strategies was a B12 randomized clinical B12 injection, empiric B12 for voice improvement. There was some hoo-ha being published about it. And so let's do a RCT. And uh, we did. Um, short story on that one, it is largely the placebo effect for a B12 injection, no surprise. But platelet-rich plasma intrigued me. Our facial plastic colleagues were reporting significant improvements with the vampire facials, heavy face studies, hair restoration, orthopedic applications for PRP. We didn't know. It seemed a little bit voodoo. I said, let's, uh, let's study it um, nonetheless. And so we, um, this is ongoing work. Um, Clinical trial. So I got a good clinical trial going on serial platelet-rich plasma injections for vocal fold atrophy, scar, and sulcus vocalis. And this is a, a little preview. Um, here's what we're doing. Basically, and there's no video here, but we'll play this in a second. Thank you. Um, we're basically, I'm using mostly thyrohyde or, or, or corded uh, laryngoscope transnasal infusions of platelet-rich plasma. And I really oh, plump this up. And PRP is still on after the lumen. It likely is getting into the body. We're trying to get as much PRP into, that's got a beautiful yellow color. And this is a before, this is during, this is an after still. Looks kind of the same, doesn't it? Yeah, looks a little bit the same. Um, but interestingly, here's our, again, this ongoing research is just a little preliminary bit here. We have 12 patients enrolled, not a whole lot of, have totally completed it, but there's some Findings here. The VHI tens drop substantially, vocal fatigue index, even bigger um, deltas. And so there may be, there may be something here. And certainly short term, everyone's getting short term improvement from this for, for several months, sub substantially longer than anything else that we're you know, putting in um, um, the, the laminar propria um, without having to go to surgery. Um, let's just play. Let's play a couple of examples. It's not dramatic, okay? The rainbow is a division of light light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long round arch with its path high above and its two ends apparently beyond the horizon. Right, let's not have one. Let's play this one. The blue... Let's see this one right here. No, yeah. No. <laughs> Okay, there's marginal improvement that most, most people, most people 
of people get here. Okay, but the strobes look pretty similar, and, but patients are consistently reporting notable improvements. And so thank you for playing this. Getting back to Hollins and G. Paul Moore's uh, laminography here, we need better assessment tools, and we're working on this. Let's play this one again over here. These are my vocal folds. This is a technology called long-range optical coherence tomography through a 70-degree telescope. And these are my vocal folds in vibration in the coronal section. We can see four layers. There's going to be something here that hopefully we can use to resolve these subtle changes that are likely happening that are leading to, to changes in people's voice that we can't easily resolve right now. So in summary, uh, it's complex. Uh, we got to think about each person individually and our four and our various arms of what's going on. Voice therapy, pretty much first in everybody. Procedural interventions, don't do permanent stuff first. Do trial things first, right? Because you can harm people. And then tissue rejuvenation still remains the goal for the future. But the finale, I'm going to bring it back to those pieces of advice that I start with. I'd like to, 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 to present those for you all to hopefully carry forward. Um, be thoughtful and curious. Thank you, Mark Pratt. Teamwork outweighs individual contribution, all my mentors. Work hard on things where you can make a difference and that people around you are good at. Most importantly, happiness and kindness is a decision. I certainly couldn't have done it without my, my wife and my kids all over here who uh, have been supporting us along the way. So with that, I will wrap 12 o'clock.